powerful testimony. Amen. I love that. It's so true. God just loves us, right? He's looking for opportunities, for excuses to bless us. Um, <clears throat> well, hello, everyone. Good morning. My name is Brett. Uh, if you don't know me, I am Pastor Ralph and Joanne's um, oldest son. And as they like to say, I'm their best looking son. Um, and clearly ahead above all of my other brothers. Uh, this comes directly from their mouth. I'm not saying this. I'm just, it's, I, I'm ashamed to say this out loud. I'm just reading what they wrote. Um, Connor, you know, he, he's close. He's the second, but yeah. Ashton, close, you know, right? You'll, Ashton, you'll always be a better ginger than me. You know, you've got that in the bag, so. Sorry, I got to do it. I only get up here so often, so I have to take the opportunity to let everyone know that I can still put my brothers in their place, right? Um, <laughs> oh, man, it's been, a, it's been a hot minute since I've been able to speak uh, in front of you guys. And um, how many of you were here last time I spoke? Not here, but whenever I last spoke, six months ago, I think. Cool, awesome. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a continuation of that message, if you were here for that today. Um, but before we do, in keeping with tradition, as Pastor Ralph likes to do, when Pastor Joanne's away, the jokes come out, right? So uh, I'm a father to three. If you guys have that picture, actually, you don't mind putting up about my family there. There's my family, my wife, Molly, my eldest in the back, Gia, uh, Mila, and Davina. And then um, when we're not photoshopped, we look like this. That's a more accurate representation. Um, I have a lot of fun with them. And, you know, being a father, uh, of course, dad jokes, right? That is, that is the thing. I think it just inherently comes to you. As soon as you start having kids, they start rolling out, right? Um, and so I just have one for you guys this morning. You know, as it says in the Bible, we come from dust and we'll return to dust. That's why I don't dust. It could be someone I know. <laughs> I'm glad I have your support. I'm gonna let Molly know that tonight when I don't bring out the duster, okay? Everyone said that was a good idea. You guys obviously signed off on it, thank you. Has witnessed. <clears throat> Uh, so last time I spoke with you guys, uh, I was sharing on something that's kind of really near to my heart, which is on legacy. Um, and there's a, a really great friend and mentor um, whose name was Miles Monroe, and he used to say that the wealthiest places on earth are not in banks, they're not in gold, they're not in museums. The wealthiest places on earth are actually in cemeteries and in graveyards, in the caskets with people and their untapped potential, their untapped purpose. People who decided to let dreams, purpose, and legacy die with them, right? Didn't realize it. And it's kind of a sobering thing to hear that, right? It's kind of a sobering thing to think, did I do everything I was supposed to? Like, have I fully lived all the things that, you know, God has planned for my life? Um, and it's interesting because we see that in, as we look in Scripture, it's very clear that God created us in his image, right? God created us in his image, so that means that we are creators. We are creators. We're ones to create something new. We're ones to create legacy. We're ones to create things that impact the people around us. <clears throat> so I spoke on that last time. Um, and today, I wanted to just go into the, the next step beyond that, the follow-up, which is that, surprisingly, it takes a lot of persistence and dedication and the ability to deal with discomfort in order to actually do something meaningful in life, right? It's funny, the greatest things in life never come for free. <laughs> or necessarily come easy. You know what I'm saying, right? Like, I would love to have a six-pack. I would love that, right? I think my wife would love that. It doesn't come easy. 
<laughs> Some of you here have put in that hard work and you've done that, and I applaud you. Congratulations. If I could just borrow it, you know, that hard work. But you can't, right? It takes, like, real unwavering hard work. So I've entitled this message today, Embracing Discomfort. Because that's what really what it takes in order to change, is to embrace discomfort. I heard it said that uh, discomfort is the currency of growth. Discomfort is the currency of growth. If you want to change, if you want to see growth, if you want to actually reach that legacy, live your potential, then you have to be willing to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. You have to be willing to be ready to live in an uncomfortable state, okay? Um, I'll tell you, though, from firsthand experience, I hate being uncomfortable, okay? Now, my brothers can attest to this as much as I just razzed them. When I was still in high school, I literally had a stick in my room that could hit every button in the TV from my bed so I wouldn't have to get out of bed. <laughs> the light needs to be turned on or off, no problem. Fan, got it. TV, got it. Stereo, got it, right? I'm like, I had all of that ready. And then I went the next step. This was before Siri came out. I programmed something like Siri in my room that I could just speak out and it would turn things on and off for me. I'm like, get the lights, turn on the TV, you know, flip the channel. Because I was, I don't like being uncomfortable. You know, when you hit that spot in bed when you're nice and cozy, who wants to get out, right? I didn't want that. I'm like, let's have comfort to the max, right? Let's just, but I mean, whoever invented the clapper, right? That was a lazy guy. Come on. That was a lazy guy. He was like, I don't want to get up to turn that light off, right? I still have that problem. I should put clappers in my house and I'm thinking about this out loud. You know, it's like there's that one light downstairs I can see shining right when I'm, I know it's, I'm about to go to bed. I'm like, I don't want to get up and go down there and turn that off. So I think as a people, we like to be comfortable, right? It's, it's nice. It's more pleasant to be comfortable than it is to be uncomfortable. Yet it's in discomfort that we find growth. Yet it's in discomfort that we find change. I know as I was reflecting and kind of looking back introspectively, I realized that every single major growth moment in my own life was traced back to feeling stuck in an uncomfortable situation. And I was faced with the choice of whether or not I was going to embrace that discomfort or if I was going to run away from it. And every single time that I chose to embrace that discomfort catapulted me to the next level. <clears throat> uh, I want to, if you have your Bibles, I'm not going to put it up on the screen. I'm making you guys go old school today. So if you have your Bible or your Bible app on your phone or you've got Google, right? Um, we're going to flip in there to Genesis 17.1. Genesis 17.1, going old school with you guys. This is a story of someone who truly had to embrace a lot of discomfort in their life, uh, and that's Abraham. If you guys know the story, uh, you're going to know where I'm going with this. Abraham, uh, starting in Genesis 17, 1, says, When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai, God Almighty. Serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you by which I will guarantee to give you countless descendants. At this, Abraham fell face down on the ground, and God said to him, This is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more, I'm changing your name to no longer be Abram. Instead, you will be Abraham, for you will be the father of many nations. You will, uh, I will make you extremely fruitful. Your descendants will become many nations and kings will be among them. I will confirm my covenant with you and your descendants after you from generation to generation. This is the everlasting covenant. I will always be your God and the God of your descendants after you, and I'll give, the, give you the entire land of Canaan where you now live as a foreigner. To you and your descendants, it will be their possession forever, and I'll be their God. That's a fantastic promise, right? But here's the thing, reality check for a moment. Abraham was 99, and he didn't have a son or a daughter. He had no children. 
He was 99. And God says, I'm going to make you the father of countless generations. If I was 99 and the Lord came to me and said, I'm going to make you a father, I would say, Lord, maybe 30, 60, 70 years ago would have been a great time for that. You know when I had all that energy just bounding in me, right? And I didn't know what to do with it. I'm really tired right now. <laughs> I'm going to make you the father of many. This is so contrary to his entire life that he's lived. you understand what I'm saying? His entire life to this point has been completely different than the promise that God just put in front of him. I don't know about you guys, but when I read scripture sometimes, I'm reading promises in there that I know that are for me that feel very contrary to my own life. Right? You're reading and you're like, is this for me? Is this something that God's actually going to be able to do? Because God, I don't know if you've seen my situation. It doesn't quite look like this. <laughs> it doesn't quite look this good, you know? And Abraham talks about it. He's like, I'm almost 100. My wife is in her 90s. God, I'm pretty good at math. And I know that things stopped a while ago. <laughs> things don't work like they used to, okay? So, his wife actually laughed. Sarah laughed when she heard God say that. And he was like, excuse me? Are you laughing at me? And she's like, Lord, I mean, I know you're Lord, but there's some things you may not know. That's not going to happen, right? You don't know the reality of this situation right now. This might be a little uncomfortable. But it's funny, every single time I have read through the Bible and we read another story and another story of these people that God used of great influence to create great change in the world, I don't remember a single story in the Bible of influence of someone living a comfortable life. If you can find one, please come and tell me after service. <laughs> At the very top of that, of not being comfortable would probably be Job. <laughs> and I think probably the closest to comfort, but still with a lot of trials, may have been Solomon, okay? And then a whole host in the middle. I don't remember ever reading a story of someone with great influence that lived a great comfort. So I'm challenging you today to think that if you want to live a, great, a life of great influence, you're going to have to embrace discomfort. You're going to have to be willing to embrace discomfort. <clears throat> In the early years of the church, Satan was on a rampage, okay? We see uh, when Christ first hit the scene, he's going around and Satan is, you know, realizing, oh my word, this is God, this is, we're in trouble, I need to stop this. And he's pursuing the disciples right after Christ departs. Because he realizes the jig is almost up. I'm going to snuff them out. So what happens, we see persecutions, we see executions, right? We see an all-out tirade on the church. And what happens in response to that? The church gets stronger. The church, church was facing adversity, and because it was facing adversity and discomfort, it gets stronger, and then somewhere along the way, Satan goes, this isn't working. The more of them we kill, the more of them keep reappearing and popping up. We need to figure out a different plan. So what does Satan do? He decides, we're going to just make them comfortable, as comfortable as possible, because comfortable people lose their edge in war. Comfortable soldiers are not great on the battlefield. Comfortable soldiers are lazy. Comfortable soldiers are going to let things slide that they normally wouldn't let slide. But if I'm persecuting them, they are going to not let that happen. They are going to want to get stronger. They're going to fight back. But if I, let, if I make things comfortable, then they're going to let things start sliding. And you look, I mean, here we are today, 2,000 years later, and there are more Christians in the world today than there have ever been in the history of the world. And yet the world is a far darker place today than it was 2,000 years ago. 
It's darker today than in the height of the Roman Empire when they had gladiators and they were feeding Christians to lions in the Colosseum, guys. Like, the percentage of people that died in the Colosseum and all those horrific things is so small in comparison to what we're seeing today. And it's like, how is that possible? How can we have more Christians now than we've ever had, and yet we have 40 million people in slavery today? Right? It's like, how do these things, but we've gotten really comfortable. I mean, and I'm right there with you. I'm chief among that, right? We've gotten comfortable because it's nice to be comfortable. (laughs) It's really nice to be comfortable. But comfort doesn't build character. Comfort doesn't build growth. Comfort doesn't facilitate change, right? Comfort doesn't build a healthy home. Comfort doesn't build strength, you know, even just like physically, month muscle. We don't get that from being comfortable, right? <clears throat> I love seeing these ads on TV for all these like gadgets and stuff that people can wear. It's like, you can just wear this while you're sleeping at home and it's going to give you all the muscles you need. You don't need to hit the gym. No, it's perfect. And it's like, yes, I want that because I want to be comfortable and I want to look fantastic. That's great. It's perfect. But it doesn't work. But what I love about Abraham's story is that God established the covenant with Abraham not just to bless him and the lives of his family, but most importantly, God established the covenant with Abraham to bring heaven to earth. It was through Abraham's lineage that Jesus was born. It was Abraham, the covenant that God started with him, that brought our Savior to this world, right? Now, I know many in you here have kids or someone you're responsible for. And I think we can all unanimously agree right now that having children or taking care of young people is just a complete walk in the park, right? It is the easiest thing. It's like breathing. It is so, so effortless and it doesn't challenge us. It's really the most comfortable thing. I don't know why more people don't do it, right? No, of course not. It is one of the most challenging, uncomfortable things. Listen, I'm only in my 30s, but I can tell you with absolute confidence that raising children is a young man's game. Okay? I could not imagine being 90 years old and getting up for a crying baby in the middle of the night. Could you imagine feeding a baby at 99? Every night, every three hours. We've been, my wife has been, I shouldn't say we, my wife. My wife has been taking care of her uh, sister's daughter, her niece, and um, she's just a couple months old, and it's been a real flashback for me. I'm like, oh yeah, that's what this stage is like when they cry every hour on the hour for no reason. Lord, I love my sleep. Thank you. We give this child back every night. You guys, maybe some of you can relate, right? It's uncomfortable. because we all love waking up in the middle of the night. (laughs) But we know that as parents and caregivers, our children, we do for our children, we embrace the discomfort for our children because it's for a greater purpose. We, our purpose is to impart into the ones that we lead, right? And that can be uncomfortable. I'll give you a little bit of a background, a little bit of a story here for a moment. As you know, I showed you earlier the, our daughters. We have three. When we were pregnant with our third, which, I mean, we had two, and we thought, well, hey, we're already this far, and why not? Let's just keep going, right? It's, we can't have more, you know, it can't be crazier than that. It can't get any more difficult. It can't get any more work. This is going to be fantastic. You know, they'll take care of each other. It's going to be easier. Um, yeah, so, so there we were. We were super excited. And um, we, I think we were at our first ultrasound appointment as we're sitting in the, the doctor's office there. And, uh, you know, I'm feeling like a little bit of a veteran now. You know, I know the right, the lingo, the talk. I know what I'm looking at because this is the third time around, you know. And, and the doctors were being sympathetic and talking to us that way. Like, oh, yeah, you guys know what you're doing. You got this. And uh, I remember we're sitting there and all of a sudden the 
ultrasound technician, she just goes white. And she stops talking. And I'm looking at her, I'm looking at my wife, and I'm looking at the screen. And she just hurries out of the room. And someone else comes in, and I'm like, that's not usually a good sign. So someone else comes in the room, and she sits down, and this is the doctor, and she starts looking through the ultrasound, and I see some things on the screen that trouble me. And I said, what's going on? And uh, she's like, I just want to keep checking a few more things. I'm like, mm, I've done this two times. This isn't the way it goes. <laughs> what's going on? She said, well, we're seeing some abnormalities with your daughter. She has a cleft lip and palate, meaning that her jaw is all open all the way up. And it looked pretty bad, guys. I'll be honest with you. And she said, normally that means that they are, have Down syndrome. And so she takes us into this other room and she's trying to be sympathetic and she said, listen, we understand if you want to pursue alternative routes beyond this. And I'm, I looked at her and I said, excuse me, ma'am, are you talking about terminating, killing our child? And she said, I'm not suggesting you do anything. I'm just letting you know there are options out there. And I got really angry with her. And I'll be honest, I probably was not being very Christian at that moment. And I said, ma'am, you have no control over this situation. How dare you suggest that we kill our daughter? Because I realized that the legacy the, pro the prophecies that have been spoken over my daughter. I knew that God was going to do great things with her, and the enemy was trying to take a moment to snuff her out before she ever had the opportunity to live out her potential. And I'm going to be honest with you, this is probably one of the most uncomfortable continuing six, seven months of Ma and I's life, was walking through this and praying over our daughter and believing for healing and believing that she wasn't going to be born with disabilities and deficiencies and pushing through that anyway. That was really uncomfortable. <clears throat> and choosing who are we gonna tell about this? Who are we not gonna tell about this? You know, who's gonna stand with us in faith? Who's not gonna stand with us in faith with faith in faith? And and then when she was born, you know, we were believing that she was gonna be fully healed, both developmentally and her brain, you know, and all those things, but also physically. And so when she was born and she still had a cleft in her jaw, we're like, no, we're standing on the word still that she is healthy. We're standing on the word that she is whole, that she has been healed. And so even though we were walking through some physical changes, some surgeries to her mouth and her jaw, God did honor his word. And she was totally healed. You know, her brain, her developmental, there was no Down syndrome she was fully healthy. She is extremely bright and intelligent. And I'm scared a little bit because she is very, very cunning and smart. <laughs> and she's only three and she can do just about anything. And um, I'm so grateful for that. But that took us pushing into a season of extreme discomfort to not take the easy route, to not take the easy path out, the easy way out, right? Right? And I know you guys have probably each had your own situation that you could think back to. You could have your own, there's many situations where you've faced discomfort. <clears throat> but I want to encourage you that when you choose to embrace that discomfort, you're choosing to move forward towards your legacy. Because when we, God gives us a vision, when God gives us a legacy to fulfill, that's a new path, guys. What God has placed in your heart, what God has put on you is unique. No one else has done it before. In the same way, it's like going to a forest and there is no path, okay? There is no nice and paved sidewalk for you to take on the brand new path that God has got for you. You have to be willing to get in there and start hacking away, right? You got to deal with some of the bugs along the way. You have to deal with some of the injuries along the way. You have to be willing to push through the discomfort to reach that goal as you charge a new path. 
I'll also talk about real quick my my oldest daughter Gia. She uh, is turning out to be very smart. She's just turned seven, and I am finding out that there's this thing called genetics where your children inherit traits from you, <laughs> whether you teach them or not. And my daughter is turning out to be a lot like me, which is so cool and extremely challenging <laughs> at the same time. Um, I have some renowned sympathy for my parents because my daughter wants to know everything and she wants to challenge everything and she needs to understand and know for certain that right is right and wrong is wrong and the only way to do that is to pick it apart until you know for certain, okay? And it's fantastic and it's so challenging because I have to, on a daily basis, stop realize why in the world am I doing what I'm doing right now that's just practically habit because I've been doing it for 20 years. Why did I ever decide to start doing this thing that I'm doing? Should I still be doing it? And now let me break it down into a bite-sized lesson for this child of mine on whether it's the right thing to do or not. Have any of you been there? <clears throat> yeah, I think God designed us that way to be those imparters of legacy, to be those imparters of purpose, to be those ones that say, I have learned and I want to teach you. But that is really uncomfortable. <laughs> it's really uncomfortable to be questioned all the time. It's so much easier to just say, just listen to me because I'm your parent. <laughs> just do it because I said so. I don't want to hear the word why. Just do it. <laughs> Do it because it'll be easier to sit down. If you, you'll catch that in a minute. <laughs> <clears throat> but it's so wired into their DNA, right? God creates us to seek purpose. God creates us as individuals to do that, to be legacy creators, to seek purpose. And we need to be comfortable to embrace that discomfort. Your God-given purpose is the most important thing that you're going to do in this life. And it will definitely have uncomfortable seasons. But if you embrace the discomfort of waiting and pushing through those uncomfortable seasons, you will have an amazing growth on the other side of it. If you're willing to take that discomfort... <clears throat> I think like, this would be a unanimous for every parent or caregiver in this room that we don't do what we do for our children for what we're going to get from them. We don't put up with the late nights. You know, I'm not like, well, the reason I'm doing these late nights right now and I'm getting up for crying children and poopy diapers and that one time they took the diaper off and flung it all over the room. Like, I'm doing this right now because when I turn 70 or 80 or 90, they're going to do it for me. When I take my diaper off and fling it across the room, they're going to do it for me. No, we do it because we love them. We do it because we see potential in them. Imagine the potential that your Heavenly Father sees in you. Imagine the potential that your Heavenly Father sees that you could accomplish. He came to Abraham at 99 to say, you have potential. And here's what I'm going to accomplish through you. I mean, if that doesn't say you're never too old, I don't know what does. There's still something new. There's still another season for God to do something fantastic in your life. Are you willing to embrace the discomfort? of that new season. I just want to pray with every single one of us here before uh, we dismiss. <clears throat> Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much that you would be willing to go through all of the trouble of making this happen, that you would set up a covenant with Abraham and that you would guide his descendants through the generations just so you could bring Jesus to earth to save us. Father, I know that 
regardless of where we are in each of our seasons, you have a specific calling and purpose for us. There's not just one that we come and we do and we're done. We don't retire out of our purpose. You have purpose for us every single day. There's something that we are called to do every day that we are on this earth before we come back to meet with you. Father, I pray that for myself and for everyone else that's here, that you would just reveal to us what that is. I pray that you would give us the strength and the endurance for those that are willing to charge forward into their purpose to embrace that discomfort. That you would give us the strength, that you would give us the patience to deal with ridiculous situations and ridiculous people to embrace that discomfort because we want to see the growth that only you can bring. We want to see the impact that only you can do. We want to see the change that only you can make. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. And we ask that you would just partner with us. Amen. Now, if there's anyone here in this room who has not started a relationship with Christ yet, I want to give you an opportunity to make him the Lord of your life. I want to give you an opportunity to start that relationship today <clears throat> so that you could be stepping right into this, so you can have him reveal to you what that purpose is, what he created you for on this earth. So again, with everyone, if you could just bow your heads and close your eyes, and if everyone would repeat after me, but if this is you, just say this out loud and mean it in your heart. Say, Heavenly Father, Thank you so much for sending your son. I'd ask that you please forgive me of my sins to make me right with you. I surrender my life, my way of doing things for your way. I ask that you would please come into my life to change it, to make it new, and help me to live for you every day of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. I don't know about you, but I, I was definitely stirring up a lot in my mind about what God's brought us through. You know, those challenges, those times of discomfort. All of us can look back in life and see those things. But I love the element that he said. It's there's legacy on the other side of those there's victory. There are people waiting on the other side of your victory that you're walking through. Whatever the challenge is, whatever the, the thing that's been coming at you, God wants you to know that there are people on the other side of that that you're going to be able to speak into and say, hey, yeah, look what the Lord has done. Look what God did for me and how he helped me through this. And give people that word of encouragement that they need, that help that they need. The way maker, right? We just sang that. He's the way maker. In every of those challenges that you look back in the Word, all those stories, those people that, that Brett was referring to, God was always there providing a way. We were just reminded of a story we were digging in about, uh, in the Word about uh, uh, Jacob. And Jacob wanted a wife, right? So he goes and he uh, makes the arrangement and he's going to be, and he told them that the father of the of the of Rachel, who he wanted to marry, said, you got to work for seven years. How many of you guys, that's a long time to wait, right? And what happens is there was an older daughter, and the tradition was the older daughter always got married first. So the night of the wedding, dad gave the oldest daughter instead. And the guy was like, whoa, what happened here, right? You tricked me. He says, well, you work another seven years, and then you'll get Rachel. And he does. He goes in, he, he takes the time through that discomfort, Waits another seven years. Jacob becomes who? Israel, the father of the 12 tribes. Rachel's youngest, or second youngest, is Benjamin, who becomes, right? He becomes, or, or he becomes Joseph, who becomes uh, the deliverer of Israel. Had he backed out in that time of discomfort early on, if he said, hey, no, man, I can't do seven years, let alone 14, are you crazy? Had he backed out at that time, all of Israel would have not been delivered. God's chosen people. 
There are people on the other side of your victory that are waiting for you. Amen? We can't always look at the challenge that we've got and think, oh God, why are we doing this? What's going on here? So we're just going to continue to worship here. I know you guys got another song. And let's just just listen to what the Spirit says. What is God saying for you? What does He have for you? What are you walking through? What does that journey look like? There is legacy and there is victory on the other side of that. Amen? Amen.